Hey everyone, it's Holmes from Home Story Books, and today I'm here to review the behemoth book Moby Dick by Herman Melville. It is about a merchant sailor called Ishmael who tries his hand at whaling and then realizes he's on the ship of a madman, Captain Ahab, who wants to catch one particular whale, the menacing Moby Dick. When does Moby Dick come in, you ask? Like the second chapter from the end, folks. Yeah, I'm serious. He's mentioned earlier than that, but he doesn't actually make an appearance until then. So if you're thinking this is all going to be about him, it's not. Let's get on with the review. Call me Ishmael. So begins one of the so-called greatest American classics. It is perhaps one of the most effective and simplest opening lines in literature, and as an aspiring writer, I'm jealous. I've read Melville before. I read a book called TP, which is a book where he discusses his time shipwrecked on a small Polynesian island. The writing was antiquated and sounded like it came right out of a curio box, but I read on anyway. So I came to Moby Dick with the understanding that Melville was something of a nerd and loved the sea more than most men loved their children. The first 25% of Moby Dick read like a classic adventure tale. We had our protagonist, Ishmael, the tabula rasa to be written on by life's experience. We had the wonderful Queequeg, a Polynesian harpooner experienced in the ways of whaling and a stick for all other men to measure themselves against. Queequeg is one of the best characters I've read in a long time because Ishmael regularly checks himself and his privilege when speaking of the harpooner, and it's the two of them against the world. Ishmael and Queequeg are in love. I will die on that hill. But Lydia, I hear you protest. There's no mention of gay or anything of that sort in the book. There is not. However, identifying as gay wasn't really a thing back then. There were gay or queer or homosexual acts, but not necessarily people who identified as such. There were only relationships. And the two of them did indeed have a relationship. Where is the evidence? I hear from the stands. Here I present to you my receipts. Ishmael and Queequeg spend the night together sharing a bed because there is no more room at the inn. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. One of the first times Ishmael sees Queequeg, he sees him smoking his pipe by the fire. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. I don't really like the use of the word savage, except to say that Melville and Ishmael both regularly say that Queequeg is better than most men, even the most distinguished ones. The narrator later goes on to say, Our own heart's honeymoon, a cosy, loving pair. Along with a whole chapter dedicated entirely to how Queequeg holds him at night and keeps him warm and how delightful that is, I rest my case. Ishmael is as queer as the day is long. Unfortunately, in terms of positive representation, Queequeg is decidedly where it ends. Melville demonstrates the power of ignorance and stereotype and the effect it has on writing with characters like Tashtego and Dagu, First Nations and African respectively. Where Melville had experience with Polynesian people, he created a fully formed, interesting, compelling character. In others where he had no experience, the characters are but hollow shells, racist, and a total product of their time. Racism and ignorance makes your writing shit, Melville. That's why we need sensitivity readers and to research and to ask questions, and most importantly, for marginalised people to tell their own stories with their own voices. I digress. On with the rest of the review. In order to teach a man how to sail, you must first teach him how to long for the sea. Melville loves the sea, and this is clearly evident in some of the passages and paragraphs in the book. His poetic love for the sea knows no bounds. I adored reading those passages because even when the sea was at its most destructive and totally wrought with a typhoon, the book was still such a beautiful read. That unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks lacquered. Clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is the insufferable splendours of God's throne. I loved the sea as Herman did. I soaked it up. I could have read pages and pages of him talking about the sea. As a writer, sometimes it is difficult to describe the same thing many times because it can feel samey, stale, but Melville's writing never did. Until the whales. Melville needs a PhD in whales. 
the author describes whales in meticulous detail, their types, their migration patterns, their size, how they swim, how they breathe, their teeth, jaws, heads, foreheads, spines, flukes and tails. At length, he describes them, adding footnotes to elaborate further. He mentions engravings, historical writings, papers, museums, paintings, and other sculptures that feature whales, as if he's desperate to prove that he did the research and that his research matters. At times, while reading, I was like, Ahab isn't the one obsessed with whales. Melville is. And then there's the whaling. Once again, Melville describes in meticulous detail the technology, the ships, and the weapons in order to go whaling. And you'd think that would be enough, but no. Melville continues to describe in detail the slaughter, skinning, and gathering of whale oil for chapter after chapter. I almost put down the book at a few points because I was so tired of whale facts, TM. I didn't want to go to whale school anymore. But then, like all great books, something compelling would happen in the next chapter, and so I would read on. And this is partially confirmation bias speaking, but it was a good book. This book is biblical in all senses of the word. Its size is biblical. Its scope is biblical. Its characters are biblical. There are certain queer times and occasions in this strange mixed affair we call life when a man takes this whole universe for a vast practical joke, though the wit thereof he but dimly discerns, and more than suspects that the joke is at nobody's expense but his own. That's it. That's all for this review, and thanks so much for watching. Bye, everyone. Thank you.